Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Culture Site. This edition of the Culture Site is dedicated to remembering someone who made a contribution which is unparalleled in this country from a cultural perspective, from a dramatic perspective, from a, the from a theatrical perspective. He is someone who has left not just a mark, but he revolutionized the entire field of culture in Sri Lanka through his writing, through his work, through his various philosophical ways of thinking, and that was Professor Edrivira Saracha. Last month marked his 25th death anniversary. Professor Sarachandra is someone who read for Pali, Sanskrit, and Sinhala uh, at the University College Colombo. He also studied at the Shantini Ketan in India. He has, um, he received a master's in Indian philosophy from the University of London, another master's in Western philosophy, a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy. Um, he was one of the best known playwrights. He also taught widely and researched extensively in this country and overseas as well. He served as ambassador uh, to several countries, including uh, France and also to um, Switzerland, as well as to UNESCO. And this is something extremely noteworthy. He was also the ambassador to the Vatican uh, and probably one of the first who was appointed back then in the 1970s. To speak to us today, to reflect upon his life, to reflect upon his contribution from a very different perspective. We've heard it from scholars. We've, we've listened to others who were involved in the field of theater. We've heard it from people who have worked under him. But today we're going to be speaking to someone who probably knew him extremely well for the most part of her life, and that is his daughter, Kisa Gautami Saracha. Kisa, thank you so much for taking time to join us all the way from the United States. It's quite early in the morning for you over there. Uh, thank you for accepting the invitation from the Avalog Initiative and for coming on board. You have contributed immensely to the field of drama, theater as well. You've done a lot of productions over there in America, uh, some of your father's, some of your own. You've also done a lot of work in the promotion of his work, his books, translations, and so much more. Um, Kisa, over to you, Kisa. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your reflection on Professor Edrivira Sarachandra. All right, thank you, George. <clears throat> it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, you know, if I get to talk about my father, it's, it's, it's even a bigger honor. So thank you so much for having me on your show today. Um, yeah, so as you said, um, it's been 25 years since uh, my father passed, but, you know, down memory lane, uh, I'd like you to, I'd like to take all of you, not back 25 years back, but say 50 years. So that puts me at about the age of four or five. And um, I was wondering when you asked me to, you know, reflect upon experiences with my father where I would start because it's it's a lifetime of experience so what I did was I just closed my eyes and you know shut out the world and just thought about my father and one of the first memories that came to mind were the ones um, when I was as I said very little about you know going to Montessori and um, in Peradenia so what my father did at the time was going for lectures in the morning and coming back he probably had lunch and had a nap he rested and then the whole afternoon was spent in his study writing so that is one of the things that i will always remember about him sitting at his desk writing on papers and um, there was always a lamp shining on the on his writing on the on the papers on his desk and what I was doing was just um, sitting on the floor, on the cement floor. It was cool and I was doodling on pieces of paper um, and you know, probably showing them off to my father. He was not interfering in any way in what I was doing. And it was just uh, just me and him just being, you know, and that's that's one of the, the nicest feelings I've, I've had probably my whole life because at the time, it was just innocence prevailing and we had no idea. I at least had no idea what life was, you know, going to hold. And um, that was beautiful. And I also remember that um, I started collecting stamps at the time. I think my father must have, he, he may have encouraged me to collect stamps. I'm, I'm not sure, but 
Um, I know for a fact that I was, you know, cutting up, that was my idea of collecting stamps, cutting up like, you know, pieces of paper and gluing them on, on like, probably random notebooks that I was given. But later on, I know he encouraged me further to collect stamps. He got me like stamp albums. That was much later. So just to say that, you know, I was always, um, I was a bit of a shy child and uh, uh, a bit, you know, just like to be on my own. And I had that, that possibility because uh, my father was also lost in his world and he was writing and I was not disturbing him. I was there in my own world. So very, very precious moments there. And um, then I went uh, to school, I went to Montessori and um, my father dropped me off, picked me up. So just to say that he was really involved in, in, in what we were doing in our lives too, although he was very busy and you know attending lectures and getting ready for all that and always constantly, constantly producing in the sense of writing. Um, so for the first five years of my life, I had my father all to myself. And I think I got, I got a bit mm. spoiled, you can imagine. So, uh, so much so that once I remember we were, we were about to, like we were driving home. My, my father had a Volkswagen. It was quite well known, you know, people saw, saw him on the street and recognized that it was his car. And um, he stopped to give a ride to a friend who was waiting at the bus hall. And I made a big fuss. I remember like a little bit, but my mother later told me that I had behaved so badly. I said, no, this is my father's car. Nobody can get into it. And my father gave in. He gave in to, to me, <laughs> to what I was, to my tantrum actually. And uh, his friend, I suppose, thought it was better to catch the bus. So just to say how possessive I had become of my father at the time. But it was all, you know, that's what children do. And I think there was, there was really no harm in it. But my mother <clears throat> had to step in most of the time. And she put some, some structure in, into, into my life. You know, she, she kind of, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> did all the practical stuff, like, feeding me, clothing me. I know she, she made beautiful dresses for me. So all that was part of my, my childhood. And sometimes it's like my go-to place, you know, when, when I have a difficult day and I wonder how do I get through this, I can just uh, think back and, and kind of like, it's kind of a source that gives me a certain energy. <clears throat> and it's important. I think a lot of people have this experience, but so this is what I think um, I will, you know, remember most about, about Pera then, yeah? And then we moved to Colombo and uh, we did a really, really interesting thing. Every Sunday, my father liked to go to the beach. He loved to swim and I, I got to go with him every Sunday. Just, just him and me because my sister was born then and she was, she was small. And um, so we had this Sunday to ourselves. We went to the beach. He left me on the beach and he would just swim out into the sea. He was a very strong swimmer. But it kind of scared me because I was wondering, would he ever come back? But, you know, he always did. And uh, I collected shells and had a very, very nice, quiet, quiet, you know, morning. Then we would go for lunch to my aunt's house. Now that my 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 father had two sisters and the younger sister Padmananda is where we went to uh, see we went to her house to, for lunch every every Sunday and uh, Padmananda passed uh, five days ago at the age of 99 so she was the last of the family and uh, my father was very close to his to his siblings and this was a very good opportunity for us to go Go spend time together for him to talk to his uh, nieces and nephews. He was very fond of them too. And uh, I think um, the next interesting uh, experience or memory that I want to take you along to is is when we went to France. So you said he was <clears throat> about about you know being appointed as as ambassador there. And um, it's true, he was also the ambassador to the Vatican and, and also to Switzerland. So we traveled quite a bit. Uh, and the first thing my father wanted us to do when we got there was not like, was to attend school, obviously, because now I'm talking about my sister, younger sister Yasodhana and me, we were both there. Um, and we, we didn't go to diplomatic schools or private schools. We had to, my father thought it was better, more you know, uh, profitable for us beneficial for us to go to uh, 
the local school. So we lived in Nui and we would walk to school, 10 minutes walk. Um, it was a very difficult experience because everything was in French, but that's that was the whole idea. We struggled through probably the first couple of months and then, you know, everything was fine. And we, my sister and I both were fluent in French by the end of like, probably the end of the year, the school year, because really we had nothing else to do but learn French. And, you know, as, as kids, we just, we just learned things so fast. Um, so French in school, but Sinhala, Sinhalese at home, we never spoke any other language than Sinhalese with, uh, with um, Tata, so with my father and uh, with my mother who helped me learn a little bit, you know, to write Sinhalese because, you know, we had left uh, Sinhalese medium. So we, we didn't know how to do that, but they were always mindful. My father was really very mindful about, about language learning and how important it is to know one's own language, you know, because that for him meant identity. Because um, unless you know who you are, um, you'll not be able to share anything with anyone else or the different cultures and people of different opinions you might meet. Um, you'll want to shut yourself down, you know. So, so he. I think, I mean, I'm analyzing all this now. He never like sat us down and said, okay, this is what you need to do because he was not that kind of a person. He was just, he lived his convictions and we had to follow. And it was kind of, you know, uh, it, we, we got the influence mm -hmm. uh, through, his, the, through the way he portrayed them. So I know now that it's important to, to know one's language, one's identity one's culture because that that puts us in a very strong position and that opens us uh, to the world and um, so that's one of the one of the very important things I learned and um, so we traveled a bit uh, by car we traveled in the country we traveled to other countries uh, because uh, we were ready and not, you know, not only my, my sister and I, so we learned French at school, but my mother went to Alliance Francaise. She learned French. Then my father had a tutor because he was busy. I mean, so um, I know that being a bureaucrat and administrator was not really his forte. So he did not really enjoy every moment of being the ambassador. But I know he brought in a message of, of culture, of uh, understanding and, you know, bridging cultures. And he was, he did that. He made a lot of friends, but I think he also needed to relax when he came home. So uh, we, um, I remember like evenings when he played music, he played the sitar. That's why I shared that picture with you. That, that photograph was taken actually in, in Paris. And um, so he also had a tutor, um, not a tutor, like a musician from Nepal who came um, regularly and he played music with him and uh, we listened. We also listened to um, Sinhali songs and um, sometimes we sang along with my father. So th there were like very quiet, uh, quiet moments and nice evenings, you know, we were not living in Sri Lanka. He was. I'm sorry, he was probably missing the country a lot, but there were ways we could, uh, we could uh, connect. And uh, then um, we were in Hawaii because uh, my father was appointed um, uh, for some, he, he received a research um, opportunity at East West Center. So, um, my brother was born in Hawaii and um, it was like, like a perpetual holiday because we went to school and after school we were picked up and we went straight to the beach because what else can you do kind of thing. So it was very nice. We, we, we liked it there. I mean, I remember I was a teenager, so I was making my friends and I was very sad when we left Hawaii two years later. But I think Tata, my father, was really ready to leave because he felt that he was missing uh, his country a lot and he wanted to start producing and rewriting <clears throat> a lot of things and actually I need to go back this see this is how memory works <clears throat> I forgot to say that after his experience in Paris he wrote a he wrote a novel so it was 
it was not time wasted. He was, he wrote with the begging bowl. Uh, and if you haven't read it, and if you get a chance to read it, that's, that's one, of his, the, one of the novels he's written in, in English. You'll see that um, there's a character and uh, th that character portrays very well uh, certain frustrations he had in that particular setting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So from Hawaii, we went to, uh, we went back to Sri Lanka and that's when my parents got really very, very busy. So, start, you know, Tata started writing again. He was politically involved again in certain, certain, you know, ideas and, and, <clears throat> and so on. So then we got, um, I got very busy studying for my exams, um, O levels, A levels, and I knew that my father was not keeping up with what was happening in my teenage life because it was too much. So every evening um, rehearsals were scheduled. Uh, there was a new production and old productions were, were renewed. So Manami Singabahu uh, with new casts and sometimes new, I don't know, new editing. My father just loved to go back to what he had done and, you know, like revisited every, every section and he wanted to add things. And it was, it was always a work in progress for him. And, and I got to see all that. So that, that, was, that was the nice part about being in Sri Lanka. This was in the 70s and 80s. And um, what I loved the most was uh, when, I, when I got to, um, go see plays with him. And uh, uh, this was like early eighties and uh, there was a big interest in, um, in big interest uh, for translated works. So there were new, new writers, new, new directors who, who started producing translations by say Chekhov, Gogol. So those are the Russians. And then we had Brecht, the German, playwright and also a French a French playwright like UNESCO. Um, so once I went to, um, to see one of these plays with, with, uh, with Tata and on the way back, it was fun because we would, we would talk about things and I didn't realize at the time how, how precious those moments were. You know, I got to actually um, talk about the play and you know, the script. And also before we, we went for the production to see the play, he would uh, go to the library, pick up the, the original text, he'd read it, and he'd, he'd ask me to read it too. He would suggest, he would never ask. He'd say, well, it might be an interesting thing for you to read this too, you know? So we had, we had a kind of um, an interesting dialogue because he was ready to listen to what I had to say. I mean, what did, what did I know compared to him? You know, I had really not that much of knowledge, but once I told him, this sounds like, um, you know, the humor in, in UNESCO sounds like black humor. Well, the actual term is dark humor, which is used in, in literature, but I didn't even know that at the time. I just translated it from French, uh, which is uh, humor noir. And I said, um, this sounds like black humor and he was quite tickled by it and he I think he even used that term in, in one of his reviews because that is why he was invited most for the most part you know the young playwright wanted him to come and see these uh, the, their plays and write a review because that's a huge boost for them you know so um, yeah and there were times when he he watched the whole play uh, there were times he just got up and left so that was a bit of an embarrassing situation for me but, uh, you know, we just, we just went through it and because we were seated at the very front row because, you know, it's, it's considered an honor to see the, you know, the, the, the chief guest at the very front, but then right in front of us in, in some theaters, like, um, I think it was at John de Silva that they had like the, the orchestra pit right in front of us. So the moment they started playing, my father got upset because he just didn't like too much noise. But then if the script was strong, if the acting was strong, usually the acting was quite strong. Um, he enjoyed the play. So he would just, uh, just follow through. And during intermission, we were, we were like, you know, escorted backstage somewhere where there was a table laid out and he could have his, his tea or his soft drinks or anything, but he, he didn't eat or drink anything that was either too oily, too spicy, um, too salty or too sweet. So he was really, he, 
you know, very careful also about what he ate. And that, that right really brings me up to a topic that I wanted to touch on. The fact that he was so conscious uh, of the balance between body and mind. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever he, he ate, uh, he made sure it was the best. And, and my mother, of course, you know, she, she took care of all his meals and she was, she's a great cook. So if people say today that I'm, I'm a good cook, if they ever complimented, it's because my mother taught me how to do that. So uh, she, she was, you know, like by magic, she would whip up some, some, some sort of, you know, nice meal for him. And he enjoyed it. He always wanted to eat a light meal and he walked uh, almost every day. He did yoga. So um, towards almost towards the latter stages of his life, he did yoga and all the she the and asana as well. So one day I walked into the room and I saw him standing on his head and wondered what, it, what was going on. So somebody who really knew the value of, um, of the balance between body and mind. Um, so this was the time in, in Colombo when I came back and I was like about, I don't know, 16, 17. That's when I really discovered uh, my father as, as a writer and as a playwright, because I know that when I went to school, people would ask me, oh, are you Sarah Chandra's daughter, really? And so on. It didn't mean anything to me because, you know, my father was, because of who he was, he, he was so humble and he was, you know, he was not, um, uh, he was not conceited. So there was no reason for me to be, <laughs> to be conceited, but I was, I was, feeling special it made me feel special and and uh, so uh, ultimately um, I discovered who he was through his books now I did not read a lot in Sinhalese because it, I found it difficult to connect with the language I have traveled a lot and there were like you know they, I was just not into reading in Sinhalese at the time but I did read a lot in English I read a lot of his novels um, like things that were written about him so I went places with him. I saw him directing the plays. I saw him, uh, the way people treated him. And so I really, I felt very good about knowing him as a writer too. So he kind of completed his image, I think, by then. And uh, then I started, um, uh, you know, now, now when I think back, I think there's a lot, a lot of things I need to do. And uh, starting with translation because all his his books his works need to be need to be shared with the world now a lot of people say um, I know Lakshmi Di Silva translated uh, Singh Bahu and Manami during my father's uh, while he was alive so he was uh, I think she was very fortunate because she was able to actually discuss and and get his approval for everything she did um, I do not have that privilege but um, I will work on his, uh, on his um, books uh, as much as I can, uh, given all the time I, you know, within the time that's left for me to do all that. And um, yeah, I think um, that's about it. There's, there's a lot to say, but I think I, I, I wanted to kind of uh, choose the, the key moments uh, that, that affected me. Um, you know, there was a time when I was um, when I was a teenager again in Colombo, and I had, of course, I, at, at school I had a lot of friends, and they would talk about their parents and the things they did. You know how they, I don't know how they went to the zoo or they, how they had hot dogs, and you know that that kind of like the, the normal life, which I did not have. And at the time, um, the precious moments that I had with my father did not mean much to me, but. But it's different now, of course. But again, when I talked to my elder sister, uh, Sunitra, she's told me that um, Tatla used to take her out uh, to eat Chinese because they both, they both love to eat Chinese food. Um, I know that he and I shared so many moments. And uh, then my sister Yasodara, she spent a lot of time on stage. She was, she was a, you know, acting in lead, lead roles in my father's place. So was I, but after me, she was also there, uh, very much uh, uh, working very closely with Tata. I think she got a huge influence there. And my brother got to go to the zoo 
on Sundays with my father. And that's such a, such a fun thing. I think he enjoyed it a lot because his favorite animal is the hippopotamus. Um, so they, um, he told me that they went to the, uh, to the zoo and stood at the gate waiting for the hippo to come out of the water. And sometimes they stand there for a long time and the hippo never came out. But, you know, it was okay and they kept trying every Sunday. So I think, um, you know, when you talk about normalcy, you have to also think that it's a relative term because... Um, you know, every every child will have their particular experiences with with their with their parents, with their father, and um, I think that's that's what it was for me. Um, and um, if I may, uh, I wanted to. Do we have time for me to just quote something very quickly? Oh yes, of course. Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. Um, Singaba, who being my favorite, favorite play, uh, I thought since we spoke about a father and about a father's love for his children, because Singaba, who is all about that, is about the love uh, parents have for their children. And uh, I just wanted to just quote something very quickly from, from Lakshmi Disivva's translation of Singaba, who, and this is what the chorus says at the very beginning. Is, Love of a son goes deep, piercing skin, flesh, and nerve, seeking the bone, cleaving deep to the marrow. It gives incessant sorrow. So that's from Singabahu. And uh, also, um, my, the last translation my father worked on was um, Kadavalalu. He titled it, it's a short play, he titled it uh, Glass Bangles. So it's still unpublished. And I had the privilege of working uh, with him on that translation. But um, it was... Um, it was it was rather quick. I just read through some other things and I, I saw the... Um, the script yesterday I had written a few annotations, but I wanted to also, uh, you know, mention the fact that my father had kind of an insight into, into human nature and uh, not only women, not only men, but, but children too. So this, this is the song of the, um, the teller of the, of the past. And, and this is what he says about, about children. Many are the fancies that sprout in the child mind and spread in many directions, unlimited to the existent world and spreading as far as the Naga world. So I know that taken out of context, it may not seem much, but I feel that um, this is what he saw, that the purity, uh, that lies within within the child mind and um, yeah so um, I I hope uh, uh, Shaman Jai Singh I call him Shaman Mama is here today I know he had plans to attend um, so the 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 play I just mentioned Kada Valalu uh, Glass Bangles um, was also a play Shaman Mama acted in he was the he was the the teller of the past, the narrator. And he was also the narrator, uh, the first narrator in Maname uh, in 1956. So it's, it's, a, it's an honor for, I think for me, if he's here today and if he can say a few words uh, and what he remembers about Sarat Chandra. Over to you, Shaman Mama, are you there? Yes. Oh, yes, see. there you are. You can see me? Yes. Yes, we can. Now a very old man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your time with us yeah. too and joining Kisa. But I have had a very intimate, very close and spiritual link with the great Professor Sarat Chandra, whose daughter was speaking all this time. Mm -hmm. It is a tremendous, a considerable... Uh, spiritual link that I had with him, I learned. He virtually transformed my 
uh, thinking and uh, my whole, uh, to a large extent, a good part of my personality. And uh, of course, gave me the wonderful opportunity of, uh, of opening his plays with Barnaby, the great play, I call it, <laughs> in as far back as 1956, when uh, I was a first year student at Perazania University. And uh, that was, uh, that Baname was a, was a real, uh, not only a major, he, not only a huge landmark, national landmark, that's, that's of course understood, given, but it was uh, very transformative of my own personality and in fact my career up to now has been very much mm, determined by my performance and my association with Banave, which also meant the commencement of my association with the great professor. That I could say that as a by way of introduction, unless you want me to say anything specific, because there's so much to talk about. No, that's really interesting. That's so good that to know that um, I know I can imagine because 1956 was a revolutionary year in so many fields. Yes. You had a political revolution taking place from a cultural perspective, from a, a cinematic perspective. You had Lester James Pierce coming out with uh, he, one of the first films that came out at the time, Rekava. You had Maname coming onto the stage. There was a real cultural change that was oh, taking place and you were a part of it. Yes. And so that, that's something really good. And I'm very happy that uh, Kisa also invited you for the session. Thank you. Thank you so very Thank much. You uh, Kisa, you'll be happy to know that yeah, sorry, what do you say? Sorry about that. Kisa will be happy to know that uh, Dasni is also with us. Uh, ah. Dasni is Kisa's daughter. And Dasni mm -hmm. actually is, um, uh, well, a child of two parents who are both very much into the field of culture. Ah. Uh, Jagat and Kisa have ah. both been so enthralled in the field of uh, culture in Sri Lanka over the years, and of course, continue doing that over there. Dasni, I do believe you're with us, Dasni. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Hi, Dasni. Hi. Dasni, you grew up in a family in which you saw culture on a day-to-day -day basis. I remember when you were in Paris too, uh, your mother had a drum at home. She had so many instruments at home. Uh, she made sure that you also were very much a part of culture and you learned culture wherever you were, whether you were in America, whether you were in France, wherever you were. You never lost touch with um, some of the heritage that comes through your family, Dasni. Hmm? Yes, absolutely. When you, when you look back at that, what has the experience been like? Um, yeah, I think it has. it's a very interesting like um, environment to be around for me because I was, like you said, I grew up in the United States um, around like all my friends were American or had been born and raised there. Um, and so it, it was like kind of a like a whole new world that was like my own at home. Um, and, and like we had, like you said, um, my father always had like dance classes. He taught us drumming. Um, Amma and Apache were always like uh, producing Sia's plays like from like a really young age, even though I didn't know necessarily like um even like what the plays were about or I didn't understand fully because I only had so much understanding of Sinhala like I was still always surrounded by the plays by the music the songs um that was like always a part of my life and even though Sia like I never met him in person he was um yeah just always his presence was always there um at home um and even you know with our like other members of our community um and so yeah that was a very unique experience I do think it was one to be honest that I rejected a little bit when I was younger um because I was so immersed I think in like American culture and society um but growing up I really reflected on that and I really like appreciated having that as a child because it it made my experience in my life um, so unique and so, um, yeah, so special because I could 
connect to that culture. I could connect to Sia. I could connect to um, all of the things that he did and all of the influences that he had um, without necessarily even being in Sri Lanka or without necessarily having met him. Um, and I think that was that was really important to me. Um, and uh, yeah, and I um, I also, as you know, George, um, ended up going to Denison um, for my undergraduate studies, for my bachelor's. Um, and I actually found that because um, Amma said one day, oh, you're looking at liberal arts colleges. You should look at this one that I know that, you know, my father taught at and where I was born very close to. And I didn't even think like it was kind of in the back of my mind. I didn't think that I would end up going there. Um, but I did and I went there and that is, yeah, very close to where Amma was born. Um, and I ended up going into the archives there and finding a lot of information about Sia and his time there that not a lot of people necessarily speak about or know about because it was outside of Sri Lanka and it was for a short period of time and um, Amma was born so he ended up cutting it even shorter. Um, but yeah, so I, that was just a very unique experience for me. And I think Sia has just kind of always been in my life. And I think that's the legacy that we should protect um, because even without knowing him, I was able to, uh, you know, keep that, keep his legacy alive and still know so much about him and still be able to, I actually did some translations for my like final thesis of, some of his English works into French. Um, and yeah, so I think it's it's really good to be able to continue that um, even yeah, without- Yeah, let, let me add quickly that Dustin is helping me with, with one of the transitions and we're working on it together, so. Yeah, and that's been an incredible experience as mm -hmm. well for me. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, what is most this important. Is where, this is where translation into as many languages as possible perpetuates memory, perpetuates understanding, shares awareness, mm -hmm. knowledge, takes it to a much deeper, much wider international level. Uh, I remember even mm -hmm. when um, we had the staging of the production for his 100th birth anniversary in Paris at UNESCO in 2014, I remember you had the French text coming up on a screen so people would be able to understand the dialect, even if you didn't understand Sinhala, you were able to understand the uh, conversation, the story, what the plot was, you, you understood it. And that was where language was very important. So uh, whilst dance, music does take on um, an all encompassing nature, uh, there are things like literary texts which need to be translated and that really makes a huge difference there. So kudos to uh, both of you for what you are doing in continuing his name, making sure that, um, I mean, he's not going to be forgotten for quite a long time. I mean, for the rest of um, the duration of culture in this country, uh, 2,500 years from now, they'll be talking about Sarat Chandra and the work that he did. I mean, that's a guaranteed fact. But this is where keeping that memory, keeping that going, that's something that remains absolutely essential. Kisa, if I were to just ask you, you made some lovely points there, Kisa. You talked about how he would go to the zoo and he would wait until the hippo arrived. Yeah. He would wait <laughs> with the runs, he would wait there. He would take you to the beach, he would spend time. He wasn't completely enthralled in uh, his books and writing. And he, he, he was actually, a, he, we could identify him. We talk of him as a cultural icon. I think we need to refer to him as a philosopher. He studied Indian philosophy, Western philosophy, Buddhist philosophy. Um, he, he really immersed himself in the understanding of what philosophy was all about. Uh, mm. Did you, I mean, you said you had conversations with him going sometimes um, to a production, coming back from a play. Do you remember any thought-provoking conversations you had with him uh, at some stage? I know there's a lovely photograph of him sitting in your Madhamidula in um, your home in Sri Lanka. Uh, on a low table and chair, and he's writing. And that's a lovely photograph that I've seen, and you have it on uh, his website as well. Um, did you did you ever come to a situation where you had some kind of conversation, which was where he he reflected on some aspect of life, maybe, and something that you still remember? 
Yeah, <clears throat> there is a moment that comes to mind. I think that there may have been several, but <clears throat> I remember when he was uh, towards, this is like towards the very end, um, when he, um, he was lying in bed <clears throat> and he could not really, you know, walk anymore. And he was, um, he was looking at this cat. We, we had a cat, her name was Leah and she was sitting in the sun and uh, you know, being very happy and feeling warm. And he looked at the cat and he told me, look at, the, look at this animal who is so carefree and who is so, uh, you know, relaxed and at ease in the environment. So I think maybe he was not himself anymore at the time. And that's, uh, that's why he had to point that out to me because I think the main thing I remember about him, like you say, he he was where he was, you know, and that's, that's what's important to be where you are, um, to be in the moment where you are. So he was very grounded and he was um, able to enjoy every moment uh, within that moment, you know, not be anywhere else, but be within, in, in the moment. And that's, that's, uh, that's how I have seen him and um, I have come to understand him in, in that way. So maybe at that particular moment, he, you know, the thing about him, he doesn't kind of deliver lectures to you. He just, um, he, he would give a, you know, a little sign of something, open up a little door, and then we would have to go through and, and find that information for ourselves. So that's why, um, these moments are very rare because with us, at least with me, I don't remember so much, but I know that with some of his friends and his colleagues, uh, he may have gone more into detail about things, but uh, yeah, he was very much part of life. I mean, um, like you say, he's a writer, philosopher, you know, a playwright, but he was also a, a human being, a very, very true, very, very pure, very um, easy to live with. He's very personable. He was very, uh, you know, very popular among, among, among people, among his friends or his students. They just loved him because he was, he was so personable, so open, you could talk to him. And there was always an exchange of, uh, of ideas. He, he liked to be challenged, you know, he liked to hear people say things that were not necessarily his convictions or his beliefs. So he liked to be challenged a lot. Yes. And he appreciated that. And he, I think that's what, what made him such an interesting person. Um, yeah. That's good. Kisa, so there's a question that's coming in asking about the translations and one side of it is uh, will it be in the form of a script that can be staged with the songs? Can you sing the songs? Are there going to be lyrics that are going to be able to be sung? Uh, and also referring to the translation that you read. Um, and the question is, while it is clinically accurate, do you feel that it is really capturing the soul of the original lines? I mean, sometimes we say that when we translate from one language to another, right. um, there's something that is lost in the translation. Um, what efforts are being made to try to preserve that? I'm sure it's, he thought mm. in Sinhala and he wrote in Sinhala. Right. Uh, I guess that would be a huge challenge that you must be uh, encountering at the moment. Um, right, yeah, like this, is, this is a, yeah, I'm sorry. This is a huge topic. I mean, you know, this could be like a topic for conversation uh, by itself, but uh, to make it really quick, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, my father, he, he wrote books in Sinhalese, he wrote novels, and he he actually rewrote them in, in, in English too. So I think for him, moving from one language to another, <clears throat> it is a difficult task, but it's not impossible. And we know that that's why translation exists. So you just have to, uh, you just have to, um, you have to know what you're doing. You just have to feel the text, you have to feel that, that energy, you have to feel the, the nuances and uh, you cannot, like you say, if, if it turns out, if it sounds clinical, then, then it's wrong, I would say, you know, because uh, there are ways to translate from one language to another. It's, it's really not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Um, and it needs to, uh, and the person who does it needs to have that sensitivity and needs to, I mean, ideally work with, with more than one person through discussion and that that and I think when Lakshmi Disilva translated Singabahu, 
um, she had the privilege of, you know, having my father read the read the script, and uh, I think he liked it. And there is also, um, you know, there's a, in the in the introduction, um, he he says that that he's he's very satisfied with with her translation, and also of Manami. So. Uh, whether they could be sung, I do not know because, um, well, I guess it's possible uh, because uh, what uh, my mother was telling me recently was that thing about Maname was translated into Tamil and she was able to work with musicians to, uh, to create tunes for the songs because the idea there is to, is to stage the play in Tamil. So there is... There is a closeness, of course, in the, in the languages, and there are, there are ways to work work through that. But when it's when a play um, like Manami is translated into English, um, I I do not know how that would sound, how the music would sound in English. But again, I know it has been tried. I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, uh, Shaman Jai Singh Mama would like to say something about this. What's it about, uh, Kisa? Nice to see you. It, nice to see you too. <laughs> you were a small thought at the time. I was conscious about your presence there. Okay, so it's about you know, say, say Manami. You do, you do know that Manami was translated into English. So we were wondering if, uh, if we were to create a, a musical score for Manami, how would that sound? Mm. In English. English? No, yeah. is, are they into English? Has it been? I'm not yes, it has. Ah, Lakshmi did it or who, who did yes. it? Yes, Lakshmi did it. I haven't seen that. But you know, uh, there is a, in this instance, I would like to remind you of a famous quote by, was it, um, uh, some English, it says that uh, poetry is that which is not translatable. <laughs> so I, I would I would be very very cautious about making an you know assessment there because it's simply not translatable. You cannot translate Singapore. You can do something, but <laughs> you just it's not the Singapore. Same same with Baname and uh, with Pema of Jai the Soko. That's the other play I took part in uh, Professor Sarachandra's uh, uh, drama you know portfolio. I love that play very much. Uh, I did about 26 times because uh, the, the chef Daya was uh, there and he had passed away and suddenly Professor met me somewhere and asked me whether I could take part and I did it and I enjoyed it. But that's the position. I, it's a very difficult thing to translate. Uh, uh, now, even if you take the well-known translation we had in Sri Lanka, which ran into many, many thousands of shows, Henry Jayasen has uh, Caucasus uh, in chalk circle, Hunumate uh, Katawa. He, he did a quite, good, quite a good job, but yet, for, but he, when it came to music, it was a totally different thing. Because Shelton Prabharata to Sajan, that was in a different idiom. And uh, it is a very difficult transition from uh, the original English into any other language uh, when it comes to poetry, because Sarachandra was all poetry. To me, he was a he was one of the greatest poets in the history of uh, Sri Lanka. He was a poet, essentially. And of course, a philosopher, a good philosopher, a good poet has to be a good philosopher. And uh, I, had the, I had the great privilege of associating so closely with him uh, and, and, and listening to his views, knowing his opinions on, on almost every matter because he confided with me. <laughs> and such a lot I know about, know about him. That uh, uh, it's, 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 it's the canvas is very large. So the answer to your question about whether it could be, uh, uh, you know, put into singular music, it, it can, but it'll, it'll have to be a different different construction. Right. It'll have to be different. You can't get the same thing. That's that's my my uh, my uh, old view about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So see. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jai Singh, for that reflection there too. Kisa, when you when you look back at your childhood, you've lived in so many countries. You um, he you started off here. You were in the U.S. You were in France with him. 
uh, you saw a lot of it. Um, you you knew him not as as you very rightly mentioned, not as this great icon, but simply as your father. Um, when you when you reflect upon it, and you said at that time you didn't realize maybe how significant it was in your childhood. Maybe later on in life you began to realize the position that he held in society and um, in Sri Lanka and around the world. And Dasmi just talked about some of the research that can be done in some of the universities over there too, which uh, talks about some of his work. For you, who is Edri Vira Saracham? He is a lot of things to a lot of people, as Mr. Jai Singh also mentioned. He, he's a poet, he's a philosopher. We can call him so many things. Yes, he was your father, firstly, but if you were to put it into a sentence or two, who was Edri Sarat Chandra to you? That's a, that's a huge question, but let me just say that in spite of who he was to society, uh, he was my father. And um, he was, I am now his biggest fan. So it, it's kind of, um, there's, a, there's a dual role and you, you can't dissociate one from another. Um, I am now his fan because now I'm discovering who he really was through his writings. And also, you know, when you, when you go into a text and uh, you tr start translating it, you read in between the lines and there's so much about him that I'm discovering now. But uh, in spite of everything, <laughs> who he was to the world, to, the, to society, he really will always remain my father. Yeah. Amazing. Kisa, questions <laughs> are coming in and one question is asking about whether he wasn't interested in cinema, in movies. Uh, was that something, uh, I know he took you to watch movies, etc. but wasn't he interested in getting into Sinhala movies, uh, going into that particular arena? It was very much stage and literature, but did you, did you, can you reflect upon that maybe? Yeah, well, um, it's not that he rejected um, cinema as a medium, but I don't think he, he wanted to venture into it because for him, I think theater had something that just fascinated him, you know, that, that um, uh, the presence, the moment, <clears throat> the excitement um, of anything coming up on stage and, no two performances are ever going to be the same. So every moment we'll hold an excitement. I think he lived through that. And that's what, I mean, I think <clears throat> has, uh, has fascinated him all the time. But, you know, others might know uh, another aspect of this. But, you know, he was very much influenced by a Japanese play. Uh, I'm sorry, by a Japanese movie called Rashomon by, by Kurosawa. Uh, he watched that movie and he realized that um, there was always so many perspectives to a story. It's not just one vision, one perspective. And that's what influenced him when he wrote Maname. And uh, uh, there is that, that very famous scene when uh, the, the queen, queen says that I, I fell in love with you, she tells the, the, the savage or the, the, the man of the forest that she fell in love with him. Um, and then he, he, does not, he does not know whether she is actually telling the truth or not. So there's always, um, there are so many um, aspects to, to a story, to a situation. It's very, it's very complex. And he got that influence uh, through, uh, through that movie. So that's what comes to mind right now. But I think what, what he loved about uh, the theater was that, that presence, that, that excitement, that, uh, that feeling that it was happening now. Uh, but I do not... I do not remember him ever saying that he looked down or he did, he considered he had less consideration for cinema because it was a form of art that was, you know, just, uh, uh, I mean, perfectly appreciated by, by him because he, uh, uh, I don't really remember going to movies. Oh, we did because we were invited very often to like, um, you know, uh, film festivals, and we would go go watch movies. And uh, um, I know that one of his uh, one of his books, one of his novels, was um, almost going to be uh, 
created into a, a movie. It, it did not happen, uh, at least not yet. So, yeah, that's 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 what I think it is. It's just that uh, mm -hmm. he was more fascinated by theater. <clears throat> did you want to add anything, Sir, Rusty? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Rusty, yeah. please go ahead. Uh, no, no, I'm I'm thinking. <laughs> Kisa, did he, did you ever come across? I'm, 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 I guess I kind of you kind of alluded to this response earlier on, but did you find him wanting to see his children getting into culture, getting into the arts, continuing in his footsteps? Did he at some point um, try to influence you in that way, or was it through example and you followed automatically? Did he ever yeah, tell you? Yeah, it was automatic because, uh, you know, earlier I was telling you how, you know, it was difficult for him to to sometimes connect with our world because we were we were all in schools and different different, you know, ages, different stages. But we were always in his world. All of us were always in his plays. So in his plays and, you know taking part in like if you if you will go for like conferences and we would travel with him so we were very much a part of his world and uh, it happened more or less automatically but we were i mean we with his blood in us uh we were drawn to to theater we were drawn to all this and and then with my mother being very much involved in the, in the productions she created the, the costumes and she started managing the plays and, you know, she was very, but she acted. So um, I acted in, in my father's plays, my sister Yasodara and my brother uh, played the drums, the maddal. He was, he was, he was the youngest maddal player at the time. And um, so we were all very much part of it and somewhat automatic. It was like a, like a family thing that we, we did. Um, but um, he he did not say it in words as such, but I think he he did expect, and he put a you know a lot of trust in my mother to to carry on um, all his work uh, after after him, and for all of us to work together. I think that is something that. Uh, I can suppose that that he wanted us to do because I could see how happy he was when we were together, when we were in his place, and how appreciative he was of us, uh, of uh, my my sister Yasudra's acting, my acting, and I know my um, elder sister Sunetra. She was also in all, all his plays, and his um, other daughter um, Nandita. She was also in his place, so it was something that you know that happened to kind of all of us. We were we we're all in it. Um, so yes, I think he, um, although he'd never really expressed it in, in, in words as such, it was, it was his wish that we would, um, uh, take part, uh, in, in this and, and take it along, uh, to the next generation. Yeah. Which is it's what we're wonderful. doing. Exactly. That's exactly what <laughs> you're doing. That's exactly what you're doing. That's exactly what Dasni has already started doing. And Dasni and her cousins will be passing on to a future generation as well. Uh, and this is where the name Sarat Chandra gets perpetuated. But most importantly, the contribution that he made, the literature that he left behind, uh, will always be referred to. It is still taught in schools. It is still referred to at universities. It is a part of the curriculum syllabus. Uh, we reflect on it on so many occasions. Isa, I think we have to leave it at that. Thank you so very much for taking time today. Uh, thank you, Dasni. Thank you, Mr. Jaisinga, as well, for sharing your uh, memories of him, too. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us on this episode of the Culture Site as we marked his 25th death anniversary. And Kisa, I know he, he was someone who really influenced your life. He influenced the lives of so many people. Many people would still recall how, when they were children, they watched these productions how sometimes it even moved them to tears when they remember, when they recall, when they understand the lyrics, when they understood the words, when you actually went deep into it. And I guess that is why that question came up about the translation. And probably as Mr. Jaisinger said, sometimes uh, you can't translate poetry. It's not going to get translated the way it should have been intended, but at least an effort is being made to share 
get wider audiences aware of what was done, what was uh, how the contribution took place. So, thank you once again, Kisa, and um, uh, thank you to Jagat too. I know he's somewhere there. Uh, he's uh, at the moment. Uh, so both of you are doing some amazing work over there in the US. You, uh, we've seen you singing. We've seen you directing productions, writing scripts. Uh, he's involved in the field of choreography. Uh, so many of these areas, uh, very, very good to uh, see this being continued uh, over there in the United States. And of course, your mother is playing a monumental role here in Sri Lanka uh, in, and your sister in Australia and your brother joining you in America as well. Uh, so many people who are doing so much uh, for Professor Edrivira Sarachandra. But it's actually nothing in comparison to what he did for the world of culture in Sri Lanka and in this part of the world. So thank you once again, Kisa. Thank you, Dasini. Thank you, Mr. Jai Singh. And thank you to everyone who joined us on the Culture site on the Avalog Initiative. We will have another session next month. We've also got new platforms opening up in the month of October, and we look forward to your continued engagement with the Avalog Initiative. Thank you once again, and have a good evening, Kisa. And have a good day to you over there. Thank you, George. And be safe, be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.